Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of our Tri Talk series here on the Tri 312 Network. I am your host, Coach Brian. We are back after a little bit of a hiatus over the last several weeks and about a month because it has been super busy here in Chicago with all the triathlon stuff going on from races, Chicago Triathlon, Super Tri, Ironman. So many things going on in our region. So a little bit of a hiatus, but we're back now. And great first interview coming back after that break with a professional Ironman triathlete out of Rockford, Illinois, Erica Dankers. Erica sat down with me to discuss everything from how she got into triathlon, coming from a run background in high school, to playing competitive ultimate frisbee, to winning races as an age grouper, and then her rookie season in 2024 being a professional triathlete while also being a full-time professional aerospace engineer so really wonderful conversation really interesting stuff really hoping that there's a lot of great information for not only all of our age group athletes out there but potentially also for those that are interested in becoming a professional triathlete themselves uh, we are also going to talk about our mutual excitement about the first Ironman race coming to Illinois, and that is the Ironman Illinois 70.3 in Rockford, Illinois, starting June 22nd of next year. So with that being said, please welcome Erica Dankers. All right, welcome everyone. Hello everyone on our Try 312 channel. Welcome again to our Try Talk series. And today we're really excited because for the first time we have our very first professional triathlete we get to interview and speak with today. And that is Erica Dankers uh, from Rockford, Illinois. So here locally in our greater Chicagoland, Northern Illinois area. So Erica, Thank you so much for joining us, and we're really excited to chat with you today about your experience in triathlon, and specifically long course triathlon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here and chat with you. Excellent. Okay. So first off, uh, so we did give a little bit of a bio about kind of who you are and uh, and why we're speaking to you today, but, uh, but let's hear it uh, directly from the source. Let's get to know you a little bit more and about your journey into triathlon. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into the sport. Sure. Um, so I'll start by saying I still work full time as an engineer for Collins Aerospace. So triathlon professional career is not my full time job by any means. Um, so it started kind of, I guess, I don't know, a couple of decades ago as a seed that got planted as a kid. I remember thinking like, an Ironman would be a crazy thing to do. And that just kind of got stuck there. And uh, it was a circuitous route to get there. I did cross country in high school and then actually switched to competitive ultimate Frisbee for a couple years. Um, played competitively with Chicago Nemesis. Is, that's a top women's team in Chicago. So did that for four years and then decided that it might be time to give triathlon a try. Um, so the road was paved by a really good friend who tried first a 70.3 distance and then a full and seeing her go through that training process kind of gave me the motivation to go ahead and bite the bullet. I know like for me, buying a bike was the biggest hindrance. But once once I had that, it's like, OK, we're in business. Um, and that was back in 2019. So after that, it that first one went well. It was really fun, got into it more seriously. Um, and the rest is kind of history in terms of continuing to keep training and pushing. Okay, so many great bits of information and backstory about you there. So competitive Frisbee. Uh, yeah. So what was that like? Yeah, so first off, not Frisbee golf. I get that a lot in terms okay. of like standing around and playing. It's the yeah, seven, yeah. seven full field, lots of running. Yeah. I got to college. I wasn't a good enough runner to walk on the cross country team. Um, but I knew I wanted some sort of competitive athletic environment and our club team at, I went to school at Bryce University. Um, okay. Our women's club team was pretty solid. Uh, and that was a super fun group of people to play with and just got into it and loved it. We ended up winning our nationals uh, my junior and senior year. So, uh, so it's always been kind of like the competitive drive pushing me in sports, but. Yeah. Um, and do you feel that sometimes translates over into Ironman? Yeah, it's interesting. I 
I'm not born with any fast twitch muscles. So that whole like sprint development, I think helped my power on the bike a ton. Um, other than that, just probably like the adaptability, being comfortable with weird nutrition. Those tournaments are two days, kind of eight hour a day type things. Wow. Um, so it's just like eating whatever. <laughs> Before as a runner, I was like, okay, I can only eat these two things and I have to drink water and then playing ultimate is like whatever goes. So yeah, this is not your full time gig. Uh, I would imagine it would be very difficult for, for most uh, professional triathletes to sustain a, uh, a long-term living, uh, just by doing races, uh, every other month or, uh, as, as often as you do, but, uh, for, for the time that you do have to train and being out on, uh, and, and doing races for you being that it isn't your full-time job, how often are you trying to be in racing, uh, in races? Like how does that, normal life <laughs> uh dictates what races that you're signing up for um based on point value of the race uh location uh travel expenditure all those kind of things like what what is it what are some of the key things that you're having to sort of navigate in order to select the races that you're going to participate in yeah i think um work schedule both in terms of deadlines that i have to be around for and then also vacation time kind of limit what i'm able to do um, and then in general, just this year with the pro schedule, I wasn't able to drive to any races. So that adds kind of the travel burden, both time and cost wise. Um, so it was a little lighter schedule than I was hoping for. Um, I've got some personal stuff going on this summer too. So good, it's good stuff. I'm getting married. So hey, congratulations. <laughs> um, thanks. I needed to, to bank some time for that. So it's, yeah, it's it was a good, good thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, but, uh, just, kind of having to be a little strategic about what I was trying. It was interesting. This was the first season that they did the pro series. Okay. Um, and that kind of re-racked how some of the events looked, especially in terms of who was showing up to events. And I, I think in general, the result was really strong fields at pretty much all of the North American events. Um, so super humbling, but great to toe the line with some really fantastic athletes at each of the three races I did this season so far. So um, is a good starter experience. Coming back to the beginning now, getting into triathlon, making the transition, you've, you've done cross country, um, you've been in competitive team sports. Of the three disciplines, aside from getting that first bite, uh, what would you say was the hardest transition for you to uh, adapt to or build success with out of the three? Yeah, good question. I think uh, swimming continues to be my weak point. I, um, especially with the wave starts or not the wave starts, the, the mass starts of the pro swim compared to the rolling starts in age group, I've mentally and just skill wise had trouble adjusting to that this year. So, uh, looking forward to improving on that next year. Um, I think it's, my swim is serviceable. It's not horrible, but it's not going to win me races. And thankfully it doesn't for most people. I can make it up on the bike. So, right. Uh, that works. Yeah. It's that, that understanding of like, you're never going to win the race in the swim, uh, but you can certainly lose it. So as long as you're able to create and generate a, as you say, a serviceable swim, then at least you're still being able to put yourself into the mix. In terms of somebody starting out, uh, you know, based on your experience going through the swim, you know, as, uh, as you were as a newer triathlete, like what would be your uh, advice and sort of, uh, or in any retrospect as to your development through your swim that, that has helped you the most. Yeah, I think um, just going in with reasonable expectations and then seating yourself accordingly for those rolling starts. It's not fun to be in a, a pack that's going to swim over you or anything, and you don't gain any extra time by doing that. So just know your race plan and stick to that. Um, I think I usually don't even have a goal swim timer. I historically haven't. It's just whatever happens, know the parts of the day that you're going to execute and you can focus on those and just focus on staying safe, finishing the swim, do whatever you need to do to stay calm. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I've gotten more comfortable with open water swimming. The more you do it, um, it's, I know some people really struggle with it, but I think just giving yourself the space and kind of like being kind to yourself and saying you don't have to get into the mix of it is a great place to start. Yeah, I think that's great advice of, you know, uh, again, number one, not having uh, having super high expectations, kind of let the swim come to you in, in a respect. 
Um, and then also uh, just to be able to be kind to yourself. I think that's a huge bit of advice that I think uh, you know, a lot of people in, in some cases have, you know, again, and it's good that we all have high expectations of ourselves or that we set goals and times and things like that. But uh, if, and it's more often a fact of like when in a race that something goes wrong or you go off course or something happens, you know, that, uh, you know, environmentally or contextually is just out of your control. It's okay to be kind to yourself and say that it's okay. And it's okay to have to adapt and adjust. Yeah, absolutely. I think even if you're not having a good day, you're still learning something about yourself that you can turn around and do next time. Um, I, yeah, just giving yourself that grace and you can process it after the fact, but not, don't focus it on the race by any means. Just keep So going. great little segue here. So looking back to your first race, what was your biggest learning experience that you took away from that first race? I, I have a lot of fond memories of it. It was Texas 70.3, which is okay. down in Houston. Um, and they actually ended up canceling the race slightly after I'd finished a big storm blew in. Um, but I had done almost all my training on the trainer. It's an early season race. We had super late snow around here, so it didn't get outside at all. Um, I had a, a dumb trainer and I thought I wasn't going to finish the bike on time. <laughs> I had no reference. I thought I was going to be like fighting for 15 mile an hour average. And I was just so scared of that. Um, and then didn't happen that way at all. Got out there. It was fine. Kind of trusted the training. Um, ended up going pretty well. And there was just so much positive adrenaline that whole experience just in general carried through. I also remember thinking that I could run the entire half marathon with no nutrition. Again, oh. kind of back to the, the cross country <laughs> days of like not being able to eat while running. I was like, oh, it doesn't sit right. I'm just going to not do it. Yeah. And I got catastrophically hungry and just like started pounding gels halfway through and it was the best thing I'd ever eaten. So <laughs> it was like, these are wondrous. What are these things? <laughs> yeah. And then the, they're flavors I would never eat now. I think Tutti Frutti is the lot bottom. Oh, of yeah. the, I would have eaten a whole box of them. At that point, you don't care. It's just, just, just like, I just need whatever it is, whatever you're serving. I love it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, if, you watch, if you watch videos of like the real fast pros as they run through aid stations and just watch their technique for grabbing yeah different nutritions they'll take you know five six cups in a single aid station um so that's something i've definitely tried to practice more of and uh you know it's out there on the course for you so make use of it i think that's that's hugely important to remind and uh, impart into our athletes especially if they're going into long course yeah i would say something like a sprint is a little more forgiving but even oh, after sure. Since and getting into the full, you might feel great those first couple miles. <laughs> and if you're not paying attention and staying on it, it's not going to continue to go well. So um, on this point, uh, yeah, on this point, uh, I actually have an athlete that has done a couple 70.3s. He's training for his first marathon, the Chicago Marathon coming up in October. And he's working with a wonderful group here uh, called Kara that does group runs and they organize a 20 miler before the marathon as sort of that 20 mile sort of check-in that uh, right before people kind of start to taper in for the race itself. And he's running with a group of uh, kids and he's like, I mean, they're probably late twenties, thirties, but to him, like he's a little bit older, so there's still kids. And he just remembers running with them. And then as he, they've been going into longer distances, I mean, they're in that 15, 16, 17, 18 mile mark at this point. And, you know, he's at their aid stations where they're stopping for water uh, up and down the lake uh, front. You know, he's crushing some gels and goos. And these kids are like, what's that? <laughs> he's like, oh, this is my fuel. These are my gels for, for my run. They're like, I don't understand. What is that for? <laughs> so he had to, like, as they've been running in this last two weeks, he's been helping them understand, like, what nutrition is, why it's important for this long of a run. And, I mean, it was like their their eyes had been opened up to a world that they did not understand before that, you know, they just had been so used to and, and maybe strong enough runners that maybe even for a, a half marathon, it might only take them an hour and a half. You know, but a marathon is still going to take them three, three and a half, four hours. So, uh, so you definitely need that fuel to sustain you for that type of a uh, of a distance. And it was like their heads were blown <laughs> by understanding, like, oh, so 
you actually do need to continue to fuel yourself uh, through this thing called a marathon. So um, I think between that and working with athletes for the first time in their long course developments, uh, you know, especially if they've like sort of gone through the rankers of indoor try sprints, Olympic, and then are now dipping their toe into long course that uh, nutrition and fueling is such an impu- uh, important part. So uh, make sure if you're not familiar with it, like, Find somebody that does know, uh, ask a coach, uh, and uh, and help them out. <laughs> Absolutely. And you'll figure out right away what works and doesn't. And just the difference in how you feel during workouts, after workouts is incredible. I For me, it was I was biking in 2020, mostly by myself, just kind of doing my own thing. There obviously weren't any races going on. And I'd get back from like a 60, 70 mile ride and just lie on the floor for the rest of the day. That was, that was all I could do until I figured out the nutrition piece. And then it's like give me a second lease on the afternoon. So, yeah. So now with, th- with that being said, now that you're a professional, uh, yes. triathlete, where are you at? Uh, so for, for reference points for any of these athletes that are like, have been doing long course or interested in a long course for you, when you're on the bike, how often are you fueling and hydrating and where are you at currently with your nutrition plan? Like roughly how many grams of carbohydrates are you consuming per hour on that bike? Yeah, that's actually something I've targeted to work on for next season. So these numbers are probably a little low. Okay. My coach originally had us started on a calorie per hour instead of carbs per grams per hour target. Okay. So we shoot for 300 calories per hour on the bike, okay. which mixes probably like 60-ish, depending on what fueling I'm using. Okay. Um, and that's a mix of liquid and gels. I find liquid easier to get down because you can just drink. I have an aero bottle, so hand stay on the aero bar is not too bad. Um, the gels are feel like more work for me, so I try and get as many calories as I can in my bottles. Um, but then, yeah, I'd say like every 20 to 30 minutes is a, a gel on the bike. Okay. Gotcha. And, and in terms of like hydration, how often are you trying to stay hydrated uh, or take a swig of uh, both your nutrition and, and hydration in the water bottle? Yeah, that, I don't focus on it. It's about a bottle per hour is what we target adjusted right. food conditions. Um, so I think just whenever it crosses my mind, I'll take a drink or if I take a gel, I have some with it. Um, usually if I'm behind on calories, I'll try and drink a bunch more. Coming up to an aid station, I try and prep to take on a new bottle. Gotcha. So that's probably as strategic as it gets. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I know probably for, for you guys, like for the speeds that you are going through a 70.3, I mean, you're you're probably not there nearly as long as some of us <laughs> on that bike. Uh, but, uh, but it's good to know just sort of like in general, like, so when, when people are listening or wondering, I'm like, Hey, so what is the, what's the pros doing? So it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's good to have some perspective and understanding of, you know, kind of where, at least generally in a ballpark, uh, where they should be sort of targeting. And, uh, has it ever been a situation where, um, you've either missed or felt behind on any of your nutrition? You felt that that was a, had done you a disservice on one of your races and, uh, you felt like, uh, you, you know, being not properly fueled enough, uh, either going into it or during. Yeah, I I have two examples that come to mind. They're kind of different situations. So um, first was Chattanooga a couple years ago. I actually lost one of my bottles with calories in it. Oh. And I had like a little mental breakdown about it. <laughs> the whole half, first half of the bike, I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to be horrible. I'm going to fall apart on the run. And then just to kind of do some math in your head, you're like, okay, I've got an extra gel. That's one thing I do. I always pack extra for something like that. Um, but yeah okay, we're going to take an extra gel, it's going to be okay. So acknowledging it moving on, that's kind of like the one example where it's not the end of the day, if it's not going to the exact letter of your plan that you wrote down. Um, And then the other was this year in Montremblant, it rained the entire time, like pouring rain. (laughs) Um, It was the most miserable weather I've raced in. It was actually pretty fun. But um, (laughs) turns out you don't actually drink water when it's you're getting rained on. I did horrible in terms of actually drinking because I was just so wet the entire time. Yeah, Um, the run kind of fell apart a little bit for me there. So um, like I said, it, it might not feel like a big deal when it's happening. But if you're falling off that plan, almost always I feel it at the end of the race, just not having that energy to finish strong. Gotcha. Um, any advice if you, uh, if, if there's any athletes out there that, um, are worried about that, like, or like, again, like I'm sure water bottles flying off or 
you know, off your bike. I mean, I've had it happen to me once or twice. Um, any suggestions on like if and when that happens? Like, yeah, just know what's at the aid stations. I read the athlete guide, listen to the athlete briefings and know the order of stuff. Um, slow down if you need to, to just take what you need. Um, if you have the opportunity to train with the specific products that minimizes your risk of anything happening, if you are to take on that nutrition, um, but they're obviously set up for people that want to try and do it without any of their own support. So there's calories out there. Just figure out what you can take on to fix that. Excellent. Great. You started out, you've got into triathlon, you're enjoying it. You're learning a lot. Uh, when you started, I mean, I mean, we're talking like pandemics right around the corner, uh, which we couldn't anticipate. Um, so was it before that even happened? Was it after the pandemic? What was, you know, not only just getting into the sport, but what was the moment where you realized or you uh, felt that the progression and the development into becoming a professional triathlete and being able to really mix it up with the best in the world? When was that transition and, and what did that look like? So I think even like the beginning of last season, I was still competing as an age grouper and I wasn't totally sold on the idea of going pro. I think for me, it's definitely like my stress relief source. It's how I want to enjoy my time. I was really wary about kind of the mental burden of having, getting, getting to compete with some of the best athletes, but obviously knowing that I'm not going to be standing on the podium in that field in my first seasons, especially. Um, so I think just getting started is always pushing myself, seeing how far I could go. My first full, I wasn't sure if that was going to be a one and done situation or turn into something longer lasting is obviously the latter. Um, but I think, like you were saying, learning, continuing to improve, seeing that progression over the years and kind of continuing to move up in the age group standings, winning age group, my age group specifically, winning age group athletes overall, um, kind of gave me the confidence to think, OK, it's probably time to consider the next challenge, which is a, a big step up. Um, and a fun step up. Was that you on your own? Were you working with a coach? Are you, and if so, were, are you not still working with the same coach? And how was that conversation for like, you know, talking through like, you know, yes, this is the right time to make that jump. Yeah, I've been working with the same coach since 2021. Her name's Elena Beekler. She's a professor at Loris College. Um, and I think I hired or found her when I signed up for my first full. I didn't trust myself to manage that training volume on my own because I think I'd like try and bike and run the full distance every weekend. Left my own advices, <laughs> just being so terrified of stringing it together. Yeah. Um, so she was a huge help in terms of uh, like setting expectations for training volume and then working with me on kind of progressing in each of the disciplines. Um, so she definitely encouraged me to give it a shot is more like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> it's like, sure. oh, yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's been going really well working with her. I enjoyed that relationship quite a bit. That's amazing. That's awesome. So, well, congratulations to her. Congratulations to you. Um, now, uh, so is this sort of first full season as a professional uh, long course Ironman athlete? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so far, how's your experience been? Ranges widely. So okay. my first race was back in May at St. George, and that was just a lot to handle. I think mentally, um, I knew what to expect at surface value, and I don't think I had done enough kind of visualization on how that was going to pan out. Um, so there were just a lot of nerves, a lot of just general anxiety about getting in the way of people, which ended up not being an issue at all. <laughs> uh, but it was a super fun experience. It's a beautiful course out there, really challenging. Um, it wasn't my best race, but definitely learned a lot. Um, and then kind of transferred that over into Montremont, which is a lot better. I think um, focusing on where I knew I could kind of compete, which is on the bike for me. Um, and so had a really good day on the bike and enjoyed that race overall. Um, and then the main was my most recent one. And that was just not weather wise where I'm going to excel. It was kind of hot and humid. So gotcha. uh, it was a struggle, but yeah. again, learning stuff. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, and in terms of where you're competing, so is, is there in, in your, and where you're at and with the Ironman pro series, uh, is there a distinction or, or are you, uh, distinguish yourself 
in like 70.3? Is it in the full distance? Is it a little bit of both? What does that look like? Yeah, this is my first full season of training where I'm not doing a full and I kind of missed it. It just didn't work out date wise. I think okay. something I hadn't fully processed was the limited calendar. You get opportunities to race in as a pro. They obviously shrink the number of races that have pro fields. Um, and it was either the dates or locations I just couldn't make work this year. Um, so hopefully next season I'll get to fit one in. Um, okay. But it's it's been nice to focus on the half distance and just kind of hone in on those race paces and see what I can do. Uh, so provide a little extra focus. I personally love coming back to the half distance after a full just because it's so much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fast. So I didn't have that opportunity this season. See if yeah. I can do it. Gotcha. At that first event, you know, you, as you already alluded to and described, like you had gone up the ranks, you've won age groups, you've won age group overall, you're, you're, you're in that higher echelon of age groupers. When you first stepped the line with the other pros, um, what do you think was the biggest distinction between like, like competing as a high level age grouper to being again with the best in the world as a professional? It, this is something that I knew was going to come up, but the whole mass start, um, which you get at the world championships too within your age group, but mm -hmm. you know from the very get-go where you are relative to the field. And again, being a weaker swimmer, that was just a big mental hurdle to come out of the water and there's maybe three bikes left on the rack. And you're like, <laughs> okay, I've got work to do. Yeah. Um, and not knowing how far, far ahead they are, that course, there's not a lot of opportunities to see, uh, turn around, see where people are at. Um, so it's just, you're on your own. And I think too, um, in an age group event, there's the field is so big that there's always people to chase down on the bike, especially with the difference in discipline skills. Um, it's a kind of lonelier experience to race in the pro field. Um, but it's also nice. You have control and you know exactly what you're doing. So I've come to like that more throughout the season, uh, but it was definitely an adjustment. Gotcha. Okay. And, um, and it sounds like, uh, you know, where you feel like you have the ability to be strongest is now on the bike. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I can joke about having an identity crisis when I transitioned from being a strong runner to a stronger biker. Right. Yeah. And I, even today, my run is, it's better than serviceable, but it's definitely not great. The bike is for sure the strongest. So just saying, okay, I don't need to be the best runner, even though I have the most experience in that. I'm going to lean into to biking and enjoy that. Gotcha. So going from, you know, just, you know, kind of getting your first basic bike, you know, doing training on your, as you refer to it as your dumb trainer. Now, when you're training, what, I mean, how, like, how did you feel you got from being like, oh, well, I'm just kind of jumping into this and learning how to do the bike, you know, training indoors to where you are now? Like, what is the primary difference for you in terms of your training? that has made you feel you've become so much stronger on the bike? I'm really grateful to the people in the community that kind of crossed paths with me early on and got me connected with group rides. Um, Cause I mean, I knew nothing again, I had done all my training indoors. So like the clothes to wear routes to ride, all that stuff was things I needed to learn. Um, and I still ride with a bunch of those people. So it was really nice to kind of join that community, have them push me, um, and then since then, I met my fiance, who's an ex-pro cyclist. So he absolutely oh. has helped me level up. And we've done a lot of bike-specific focus and, um, you know, gotten the fit dialed, all the good stuff. Gotcha. So, okay, advice. So, Mary pro <laughs> cyclist. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I joke about it, but it's true. <laughs> it's really nice. So, no, this is, uh, this is a great, uh, again, great segue um, talking about how you're training your life as both, uh, you know, a professional in two different respects, professional engineer, professional pro triathlete, uh, in long course, no doubt. How has that, uh, affected training, race schedule, and just life, uh, around, uh, Ironman? And how do you feel it currently sort of like affects, you know, some, the positives and negatives, uh, with regard to relationship, you know, getting ready to get married, all of those kind of things. I think uh, to start with the relationship piece, I've had past failed relationships that where the partner just didn't understand the time commitment either to triathlon or was ultimate frisbee before this. So, you know, like finding someone who at least gets it, they can participate with you or they can let you go do your own thing. But 
um, that was really key. And it's been super helpful to have someone who's on board and supports me in like coming out on rides or at least giving me routes. Yeah. Um, so it's good. And then I think I had mentioned it's kind of a stress relief for me. So it's nice to kind of finish the work day with some kind of meditative workouts. Usually uh, swimming's my favorite in terms of clearing my head. Nice. Uh, but I just feel balanced and well-rounded when I'm able to kind of work out after work. Um, I think like looking at what the top pros are doing, I feel like having a 40 hour per week job probably limits some of the fancy recovery and extra strength workouts and three a days, whatever they're fitting in. I'm like, I, I can't do that. So just have to be smart with my training, really focus in the, the high focus sessions um, and make sure that we're hitting all the high points. With being normally 40 hours a week, you know, give or take, you know, I'm sure yeah. being an engineer, it's probably a little bit, uh, a little bit more dynamic than that. But uh, on average, like when you're in prime race season, like what is your average training time for, uh, for your racers? I think for the half distance, so I didn't do the full this year, but the half distance is usually like 12 to 14 hours a week with the bulk of it coming on the weekends. I think during the week, it's maybe a longer ride that's an hour and a half to two hours and then a brick workout that's an hour and a half but other than that pretty much everything's under an hour um again depending i know i skip my strength more than i should so i get i get an hour back from time to time um but try and divide it up so i can fit it in either before or after work gotcha and um erica do you do you find yourself like at any point during the year where you try to give yourself like what we would refer to as an off season, like time to regroup, reset, take a vacation, um, spend a little bit more time with family, uh, maybe transition to doing maybe more strength training than you may not normally do, like during the bulk of your your either uh, um, build season or, or, or actually in race season. So do you ever find yourself trying to, um, you know, that you actually have that uh, during a race season or do you try to at least block off some amount of time for those type of things? I'd say like between the A races. So for me, that was like made uh, pretty early this year, July. That was just solidly triathlon only. And then outside of that, um, I don't walk away from any of the disciplines completely, but I might do like a run block. Last year, I raced CIM. So that was California International Marathon. Um, a nice chance to kind of bolster the run piece of it. Um, I also like there's a trail series in Rockford. So I'll do some trail races hoping to try some cyclocross this fall. So just kind of mixing it up, trying to find fun ways to still challenge myself, but maybe not sit on a trainer for four hours. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a healthy thing for us to all uh, remember to do is like, you know what? Sometimes it's okay. Just step away from the trainer, <laughs> uh, you know, step away from the high intensity stuff. And uh, now if, if, if you do any cross training out there, you know, when it's not the three primary disciplines, um, if you have a go-to cross training or thing that you kind of allow yourself to kind of get away from like the primary stuff, is there something that's like that for you that you're like, oh, I love just doing this and just kind of getting away from triathlon for a little bit? That's a good question. Um, I would say not specifically outside of, I'll do versions of running or biking, but it's still running and biking. I but like both of those a lot. Yeah. But mountain biking for me, my handling is not great. And that's been something I've been working on. There so that's just kind of like a different way to practice skills that I wouldn't get on the tri bike necessarily. Also see some different geography. So yeah. um, it's a nice way to mix it up. Do you get a chance that where a lot of those are also just to go out just for the joy of it and not worried about heart rate and power and time just to just go out and just have fun and enjoy it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like when I say I'm a bad handler, I'm a really bad handler. So there's no expectations. It's like <laughs> avoid the trees and don't crash. That's kind of the goal of the day. I think, I think those are successful check marks. Uh, you know, just like, okay, like come back out like unscathed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So as soon as the main season's over, I look forward to just kind of doing some lower mental pressure, enjoy being outside, do something different. Nice. Fantastic. I think that's good advice. And again, it doesn't have to be like completely outside of, or like, a, you know, completely like non adjacent to a triathlon, but something like going out for a different style of run, maybe more of like a cross country trial run, uh, excuse me, trail run. And then also some like trail, like, uh, you know, off road or, uh, mountain biking, uh, just again, going out for the enjoyment of it, uh, doesn't always have to be about training. So, 
Yes. Um, speaking of training, and you mentioned uh, a little bit of like sort of where you are when you're going out for some of your uh, trail runs, and that is Rockford, Illinois. So, and I think for hopefully those that are watching and those that we are interacting with here in the greater Chicagoland area is we have all become now aware of a brand new 70.3 race that is being held in Illinois for the first time. And it just so happens to be in the place that our guest currently resides in Rockford, Illinois. So Erica, how excited are you to uh, have 70.3, to have Ironman come to Illinois, come to where you are, and are you racing Rockford 70.3 next year? I am super excited. I, if you'd asked me when I moved there or started racing triathlon, if this would happen, I would have said, you're crazy. This is <laughs> you're never going to get a race. So I'm over the moon that it's coming to Rockford. I think it's going to be an awesome course, um, an awesome event venue for the next couple of years. Um, I do know that next year it will not be a pro event. Typically the first time they host in a new location, it won't be a pro field. Uh, so I will be spectating, maybe volunteering, whatever I can do to be involved um, and watching hopefully a lot of people I know participate. So I'm super pumped. Great. Well, we definitely will make sure we figure out where you are ahead of time so that uh, if people want to meet you, high five you, thank you, whatever that you are doing to support the race, uh, volunteer or otherwise, then we will make sure that uh, we find you out there on course. So for those that are signed up, for those of us that are going to be racing this inaugural 70.3, for those that are becoming into Rockford, any advice on places to stay, places to go, places to eat, uh, if they're going to try to make a bit of a longer trip out of it instead of just like in and out for the race day, if they're planning on, you know, experiencing Rockford, uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, about your city and uh, some maybe sights and sounds that might be of interest to future athletes coming in to the location. Sure. Uh, so I'll say, first of all, in terms of place to stay, there's the new Embassy Suites downtown. Uh, that's probably going to be the hottest hotel for the race since it's so close to the start line. Uh, so if you haven't booked yet, would recommend looking into that early since it's not a huge facility. Um, but it's a really cool building. They rehab kind of an old warehouse type industrial modern. Um, definitely the best one cool. in town. Everything else is over on the east side. It's not super far away, um, but kind of more standard. Um, but the, the downtown area is really a neat place that's kind of revitalized in the last couple of decades. So fun little restaurants and stuff. Um, sadly, not the best place to just wander around quite yet. Maybe come back in like the next five years. But um, lots of really beautiful outdoor spaces. The run course is along the river trail, um, which is gorgeous. One of my favorite places to run. Um, and then if you have time to just spend in general, Rock Cut State Park is absolutely gorgeous. Um, Pig Mines Brewery is right there. They have lots of good craft breweries too. So I don't know, lots of gems. Um, happy to give more detailed recommendations. Great. Um, and in terms of some of the things that we may experience on this course, the river swim, the Rock River. Have you had a chance to swim in said river and any thoughts or advice or expectations for what uh, we might experience or see with our swim on race day? Great question. I would say around Rockford, not many people swim in the Rock River in that section. Um, I actually split time in Sterling, Illinois, which is about an hour south, and know multiple people that swim in the Rock River around here. I think the current's typically a little slower further south, um, so it's better for training when you got to come back upstream. Uh -huh. um, all, all that right. to say, it's the steam water, so the water's good. I can say that much. Um, but yeah, it depends on the rainfall, but there definitely will be a nice current bringing people uh, downstream. It was ripping this summer, so um, I think it'll be a fast swim. Should be pretty smooth. No turns, obviously. Just get yeah. to the other point. Point to point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, I, I mean, hopefully we do. Uh, and I think, I, I think we know this, so it's luckily we don't have to turn back around at all to yes. come back upstream and experience what the uh olympians had to experience in paris so hopefully we're not like trying to like hug the corner of the edge of the uh of the riverfront and trying to like uh swim back up a uh, course so uh yes <laughs> thankfully this last one in maine was also down river and they adjusted the buoys so it was pretty organic in terms of where you turned but gotcha. definitely scope it out and then the rockford swim you'll go under a couple bridges too so those are kind of nice landmarks to think like okay i'm halfway two-thirds done uh, kind of time where you're at in the swim. Gotcha. 
And in terms of, so I, I, it sounds like our bike course will be going uh, a little bit north uh, from Rockford, kind of up in the uh, upper northern outskirts of the city, coming back in. Do you ride those areas relatively often? Any advice or insight on that uh, course or just what you might experience, generally speaking, uh, out in that area? Yeah, it's gorgeous riding out there. I have ridden not those specific roads, but in the area, that's where I ride once a week. So I'm very familiar with the area. It should be really beautiful scenery. I will say if you come out to pre-ride, um, check Strava heat maps. There are some busier roads on there that I would not recommend if you're just doing like a weekend ride. Okay. Um, but there's plenty of other, it's where a grid system, you're not going to get lost. <laughs> just <laughs> go a mile south, find something else. Um, but yeah, it should be a nice rolling course. Come out, see the kind of elevation. Um, I think it'll be fun and fast. Good. Excellent. And lastly, for the run, uh, running around Rock River, it sounds like uh, just uh, about, a, I think probably it looks like it's going to be like a, a two loop course. And uh, any expectations or insight on the run itself? It looks relatively flat, or at least it sounds pretty flat. It, very flat. Yeah. I So I live like a block from the course. So I run that trail all the time, at least a couple times a week. Um, it's the only hills you're going to have are really coming up a bridge to go over the river and then on the other side, same thing. Um, so it should be really fast. Um, I'm trying to think of the shade. It'll be partially covered. I don't think it's going to be full sun. There'll be some bright spots. Um, but in general, it won't be like you're they're baking the whole time. Um, I'm pretty sure we're happy to hear that, especially since when we went out there to for the official announcement and launch by Iron Man and the uh, city of Rockford to announce the race, we were baking a little bit. So I know June was unnaturally hotter for the area of Chicago between here, Rockford, Madison. I think we all experienced a, a nice little uh, heat wave, a little heat bubble right around that same time. Hopefully we don't get the same thing uh, this year because... You know, I, I know a lot of us uh, now North and Midwesterners, we don't, uh, we don't deal with heat and humidity as, as well as some. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially that time of year, you can get the surprise. The first 80 degree weekend might be around that. And it'll probably be earlier, but. Um... Gotcha. So hopefully kind of more of what we're experiencing right now, uh, sort of like end of July transitioning into September, sort of like that high seventies, low eighties, uh, you know, cool ish in the morning, but um you know, again, it sounds like if for a good, fast pushing swim, a nice, fast rolling bike, a nice, flat, uh, fast course, you know, at least maybe the good news is, is like, if nothing else, you don't have to be out there for very long. So yes, uh, we yeah. all get, we all get the PR in Rockford. So definitely. <laughs> before we always let our guests go for the last little two minutes here, uh, we do a little three, one, two. So uh, any three key pieces of advice to newer triathletes? And I think for today, because we've talked a lot of long course, let's go specifically any key advice for new athletes moving into long course, 70.3 or full distance Ironman uh, and any like so and, and maybe like your one mantra that you have for yourself or about the sports uh, for us here in the last two minutes. Okay. Sure. So three pieces of advice. We kind of talked about some of these already. Um, but the first one is um, picture like having a punch card of things that can go wrong. So for example, I mentioned dropping my bottle and I had my little mini meltdown. And I talked to my coach after and she's like, okay, you got your punch card of 10 things. Whenever something happens, you just click the punch in your head and you say, okay, on to the next one. Because something's going to happen, especially on a 10 to 17 hour day. Like that's a long time. You're not going to have control of everything. So just go with the flow, move on to the next thing. Um, let's see. The next one is focus on what you can control. So there's always going to be weird weather. There's going to be competitors that you can't uh, do. You can't change your past training in terms of regrets about workouts that you either pushed too hard or didn't do enough on. That's all in the past. Um, just really control your nutrition plan, executing your uh, race and everything, keep that moving and stay mentally adaptable. And I'll look at my notes for the last one. Sorry. Oh, set multiple goals for the day. So I think coming from cross country and track where it's like you're staring at that clock, um, not going to work out in long course. So I usually have a goal for swim, bike and run and on the day, both time and kind of race positioning and whatever is working in terms of motivation, just kind of like click into that and push for that and keep moving. 
That's great. I love all of that. I think I've said something to that extent one or two times to my athletes. I think it's wonderful advice because, uh, again, like, you know, something may go wrong, think something that you can't control. But, you know, you can still every time look back at whatever race that you're doing and still look back. And as you mentioned earlier, learn something new uh, or feel good about a success uh, from some aspect of your race. Yeah, you're going to be physically there by the time you tow the line. Uh, so the mental part is the hard part of getting yourself through that and staying strong. Yeah. Uh, do you have a mantra that uh, that you that stays with you for for your racing or for for life in general? Uh, this season, I've been working on staying grateful. So it's you know an opportunity to get out there and compete and be healthy and have the funds and time to go do this kind of stuff. Um, so. I, it's kind of a version of remember that we do this for fun, but all, it's not always fun. Sometimes it really sucks. It's really hard and it hurts a lot. So it's being grateful that I'm able to challenge myself um, and enjoy it in whatever way that looks like. That's great. Thank you so much, Erica. That's great advice. Great mantra. Great information about your backstory, about your experience with triathlon, becoming a professional. Uh, on work-life balance, on uh, great advice on nutrition. Make sure we're keeping that up, uh, especially when we're going into long course. Uh, great information and uh, insights and things to expect that uh, for those of us that are excited to be coming to uh, your town of Rockford, Illinois next year, June 22nd, 2025. The first of at least three, hopefully the first of many of uh, future 70.3s in Rockford, Illinois. But uh, Erica, thank you so much for being here to chat with us, talk to us a little bit more. Uh, we would love to have you back on uh, to maybe dive into some more topics and uh, maybe even do a fun little recap after our Rockford 70.3, uh, not only from a racer's perspective, but from also somebody there to support uh, the athletes, but also to support your community. So uh, we'd love to have you back, but thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Great talking with you. Um, I'll come back anytime you want. Thanks. Thanks, Erica.